uh, after uh, John and Alex's paper, I just realized that the parabola here ought to have been a loop. <laughs> because um, after having been running around endlessly in the uh, in, uh, in topology and correspondence in a, a such a loop for the last 30 years, 15 of weeks in the dating project here, I am um, getting a sort of allergic to correspondence analysis and uh, therefore may seem a bit grumpy and then <laughs> I've seen too much. But uh, I've also discovered things that are extremely important when you do that sort of work, and uh, of which people are often beforehand not aware. Try to get the microphone. Sorry that my voice is a bit bad. Uh, typology and no, one thing I wanted to say first was that one thing I've learned from the dating project that is a number of new words. Uh, Twisted knickers. <laughs> <laughs> when, when things didn't uh, uh, agree, didn't really fit in where we wanted it to, or oh, it's unhappy in this space. Uh, so, uh, and there are probably a number more, but that wasn't too I could remember this morning. So, back to what I'm going to talk about. Topology and relative chronology have been very central for uh, the archaeological part of this uh, dating project. Uh, but it's not new to make chronology and typology. Uh, they have been the uh, ground pillars of uh, archaeological work for at least 150 years now. Uh, classification and typology are tools for organizing material culture and thus make it possible to compare finds. And chronology makes it possible to organize finds so that we know what is contemporary and what not, uh, so that we know we're not comparing peers with others or uh, something from the 5th century with something from the 7th century. In the early days of archaeology, Sweden and Denmark were uh, some of the leading countries in developing the typological and here I should change to the next picture. Uh, in developing the typological and chronological tools. Topology was in those days not just used as a method of classification, but also inspired by Darwinism to establish topological theories so that it was possible to date an object on its own, relatively seen. First and foremost, as Oscar Martinus, but also the British Egyptologist uh, Sir Francis Dietrich, were in the forefront. Uh, Scandinavian topology reached its peak in the 1950s and 60s with Mats Malmö's uh, methodological studies uh, of the concept of topology. However, he also turned classification and topology into a rather rigid tool, uh, and it was based on long, complicated verbal descriptions. Uh, and furthermore, fragments. But we never uh, could never really be fitted in because, uh, of course, a fragment misses some of uh, the uh, elements that is part of the typological definition. <coughs> in the 1960s, Helen Evans and a number of other scholars modified the idea of types, dropping the exclusiveness of the so-called uh, monothetic classifications and instead work with a classification where no element on its own was enough, but on the other hand, where no uh, other, where on the other hand, uh, sorry, uh, not all the elements were necessary. Also called uh, a polysetic classification. This mess meant that uh, they had provided us with a system which uh, cluster objects together rather than uh, putting into nice uh, defined boxes. Uh, so, so to say, you uh, divided or clustered all your objects into types so that those in that box were those most alike and the uh, next box was those that were most alike to each other and different to the other groups. Um, uh, in modern topology or classification, 
We use a number of different ways to define or describe our types, not just. We may use the Malma uh, type of classification for one thing, where that fits, and uh, the polycytic type for another, where that is, uh, is, and so on. So we have a whole range of ways we can do topology. Uh, this is an example from northern France, where uh, more or less complicated measurements and dimensions have been used to, as a basis for the topology. And what you see here is uh, axes and sexes. Uh, in the Anglo-Saxon sample, we don't have the axes, but we do have the sexes. And uh, length is a typical difference, uh, also showing the age of the sex. Uh, and in the Anglo-Saxon project, we did the same, not uh, the same method, but still we more work on the length of the sexes and the width of the blade, the length of the time, and the uh, presence of commas and so on, and were able to make a uh, division here on the uh, dimensions that we have short axes that are narrow and then they, we have broad axes which are, are longer and then we have some that are longer and still narrow. But and furthermore this division could be supported by the presence of commas which is down here and which is not uh, something that's common on the continent and we could compare it with the buckles from the uh, that were associated with the uh, sexes and with uh, other uh, sheep facings and so on, and see that the uh, topology of the sexes were actually also consistent with the objects that were found together as part of a set of sex with sheets and uh, buckles and so on. And all the way through, we made sure that the topology were kept, so to say, hierarchical because then you can, if it doesn't work with this very specific topology, you can go one level uh, up and get, uh, you know, fewer types uh, with a wider content, but perhaps it works better in the chronological way. So it was, it's easy to get an overview, but it was also for practical uh, use that we did that, or I did that. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon topology was not done in one go, but repeated several times, or say many times, to uh, find a classification with uh, enough chronological depth. Uh, as a foreigner, I, I knew about Anglo-Saxon material concept, but there is always uh, that's not the same feeling as when I'm working with files from Denmark that uh, I can feel it in my bones at this year's early. Uh, so you actually have to make a try and see how it works in a chronological anal analysis. Oh, it doesn't work. Back to the desk. Uh, what could be uh, otherwise be uh, something to look for in its topology? And I've been very much inspired by German works on uh, uh, Merovingian topology. Uh, but also seeing that uh, it can't always be done the same way, and of course also what has been done on the Illerop uh, Bach finds uh, has been inspiring, but uh, I must say their spearheads <coughs> are in magnificent preservation compared to the British ones. Uh, and that's another problem we had. Uh, iron objects. I forget to... Iron objects often badly preserved, uh, and uh, yeah, you can look at the picture. We have been working, or I have been working on basis of drawings, and that has sometimes get, given some setbacks. Uh, the draftsman is not always at fault, but he may not know why, uh, what we want to see on a drawing and that we come with a, a want to measure it, how many, how many millimeters is that or this part of the issue was. Uh, but some uh, of the drawings, they are absolutely uh, sort of uh, made 
nicer than they are in the, the real life. So the upper three gives uh, the range of what drawings of the exactly same object may look like. It also differs whether it's drawn from that side or this side. And which one do I choose to measure? It will give absolutely different results. The only thing uh, approximately correct in all of them is the height of the, uh, the shield boss. But uh, this again may cause trouble, uh, cause trouble when you do your chronological analysis. It turns up in a place where saying that doesn't fit the rest of the material. And then perhaps you may have to go, to go back to the drawing or to the real object and see is something gone wrong here. Uh, oops, sorry. Then, this, here, this first here was about objects where we measured our way to a topology. Another way is to go by shape of the object or construction of the object. And here's a French example with, bro with brooches, disc brooches, and uh, buckles. And uh, you can see in the comments there that it very much depends on the uh, thumb of the, the thing. Uh, and whereas on the uh, disc brooches, it is more the decoration and the size and so on. Uh, and it's all traits you can take in and use for your typological system. However, um, how close, how much do objects do we like to be the same type? If you look at 213 here, oh, here's here. Uh, you can see this one here is slightly different. Uh, it may be because that region here, there's only one of that specific type. And then uh, the scholars have put it into type 213. But it may also be that one that differs actually is 100 years later and belongs to a type that, that belongs in another area. And therefore it doesn't fit in, so it may be uh, a question whether it should stay in this um, uh, type. And the one down here, it's the same problem. That's again the, the, uh, the case with topology. You can make a topology, but you have to go back and check, hey, have I done some mistakes here? Because that might, may be the reason why the correspondence analysis doesn't work. If you have that bad topology, uh, you can't blame the correspondence analysis for not giving a good result. If you have the perfect topology, it still may not end up with the correspondence analysis as you want to, but the chances are bigger. Um, then this here is the um, Topology on the brooches uh, in our sample. And as you can see, the square headed brooches here are much, there are much fewer types as in, in John's uh, topological system, simply because we have only few in our sample. And uh, that means that our topology in brooches and on everything is not, so to say, global for Anglo Saxon finds. It covers the objects that was part of our analysis. Uh, and for the brooches here, you see again that we have made a hierarchical system for identifying the brooches. It would be good if someone could try to find some more of those safety pin brooches. <laughs> then we move to simulation, which is actually an, an old idea. Already Montelius. He may not, not have had it explicit as we have today, but uh, segregation of types and combination of types was all, were already in his head when he was doing that uh, scheme here. Uh, then you can also segregate so-called battleship segregation, where you try to uh, keep uh, the lights together and then you get these battleships here. It is were sorry were earlier often made by paper strips that you then move them around once you got that those nice battleships. Uh, it's fine when you've got three type of tombstones uh, over a long series of years, but if you've got uh, like Sam, those how many types did you have? Oh, yeah. Uh, imagine uh, 110 different tombstones here, then try to sort them by hand. It's absolutely impossible. 
That's another thing we must be aware of if we want to go for chronological consideration. That is that we can't, or we have to be aware of regional variation. If we, for instance, when I tried to do Denmark and Sweden in the uh, uh, 6th and 7th and 7th, 8th centuries, it's, it's impossible because we don't share the same prose types. I have to work with one chronology uh, and topology for Denmark, or not. The topology was made so that they could be fitted together, but one for Denmark, one for Bonn-Holland, one for Gotland, and one for mainland Sweden. And only when they were have been done each, you could try to compare them on the objects that they had in common. But you couldn't just squeeze them in the same analysis because then you would get uh, four groups instead of uh, a parabola. Uh, for, and that's uh, actually lapping over the next thing that uh, the analyzed objects must come from the uh, from one single culture and tradition. Uh, furthermore, it's important that the traits or attributes are taken from cultural aspects and not are not functional. Uh, you may have objects, for instance, those small uh, boxes, needle boxes, or whatever they are. Uh, that turns up in a certain period, but then they go in as a sort of uh, uh, dress bits or whatever, and not as a, a, the function of the object. Uh, and then there is a fourth one which is not on the slide, and that is uh, in some periods you have to work with the, uh, the two sexes separately because female equipment is absolutely what we'll say 90% different from the male equipment. But there are other periods where they use absolutely the same brooches and the same object and you can't make a difference out on this you have a skeleton or some weapons or spurs or whatever. So seriation in practice was in the early days done by help of paper strips in order to get most occurrences on the main diagonal. Uh, the left is from uh, probably somewhere in the Americas, and the right uh, example is most Erskine in Denmark, who was the first one who really tried to do this thing on uh, material from the uh, 6th, 7th, 8th centuries. Uh, and he was also, so to say, the really uh, typologist uh, in Denmark uh, in those days. Uh, as I said before, this here is possible as long as the units and the variables are, uh, the number of those are low. But if you get to huge data sets, it was uh, absolutely impossible. And of course, you want some practical way to get around it. Uh, French colleagues tried uh, the practical way and uh, made their Today we would have an Excel sheet, so each cell would actually be a small dominant. Why, if there was not that type in the grave, and black if that type appeared in the grave. And then they were organized on long uh, sticks, and then having all the graves, they could move around until they looked okay, and then they could take the sticks out and the other way, and then they could move around until it also looked that, uh, correct that way. And I'm sure they have done that a thousand times before they got this result. Uh, there has been some attempt to use various sort of analysis to try to achieve the diagonal. Uh, and uh, some of them is uh, sort of um, where you calculate a double number and then you can make it look nice. But what really changed the archaeological world was that some discovered that there was something called response analysis. And uh, it can be used to analyze just the sort of relationship between units and uh, elements in a set of data. So, uh, depending, uh, I know that the Danish uh, Weather uh, Institute, they are using it and uh, they seem to be okay with deciding about the weather. So, uh, why not archaeology? The correspondence analysis summarizes a set of data in two dimensions, uh, graphic form. A set of data which can be seriated appears as a neat parabola on the two first axes. 
and it is possible to sort uh, the matrix afterwards on the basis of the coordinates of the first axis. Especially when you've got this, uh, yeah, the, the example if you have the perfect data. Uh, in real life, the matrix to the uh, left hand side would not be sorted with a diagonal when you start. But when you have made your correspondence analysis, then you can go back with the coordinates and actually sort your data so you get that diagonal. The problem is, of course, when it doesn't look nice like this here. <coughs> but uh, as a start, I'll just show uh, a few examples here. Made on um, this here is on slide one in southern Scandinavia. So it's statistic elements that ana uh, on the objects that has been analyzed, and uh, then uh, the correspondence analysis makes it possible to get a sort of uh, find the development within style one, and it could be proven also that it is a chronological uh, seriation. Another one is female variants from Bornholm uh, with yeah, typical female brooches, and you can see that the diagonal turns up again. And uh, then we get to the dating project here, chronology project. Uh, beginnings are not always perfect. Uh, I can't remember whether it's this one, but uh, it, it's a main race. But one thing that could have been the problem here was the appearance of some who won. Because there are so many spheres of different types that uh, you see you have found a collection. Uh, and taking some who want out just helps a lot. But we repeatedly did those uh, analysis, taking on out one uh, time or taking out one grain, see what happened, keep them, uh, that we knew which one had been taken away so we could check them afterwards. And sometimes back to the topology, back to the grave to see how we identified it correctly. And after a long time, it was actually possible to get a series. This is not the final one, but uh, the final one at that moment. And uh, in praxis, then you get to the types uh, this way, or do we sort it that way? And uh, I'm glad they've got uh, quite high ceilings in Britain, so we could have all our <laughs> tables. And uh, do we want to go by the types or by the plots or what we want to do? And no, we have to start with square one once more, and no, it doesn't fit with that. And uh, But finally, you saw them before, the males at the left and the female at the right. Uh, yes, it's easy to use a response analysis. It can be run on any PC, at least uh, as long as... I don't know about Windows 8, because uh, for the, uh, at least the one I use can't go into the Windows 8 version, but never mind. It can be done in PC, so easy. But the problem is topological work and the selection of data. That is the backbone of the whole thing. And there is no easy way, and you have to repeat all the time to make sure that you don't have some input uh, mistakes in there or, or wrong data or whatever. So, uh, and in most publications, you see the final result, the nice parabola and so on, and it looks so easy. I think this is the first volume where you get all the steps forwards and backwards and so on, to see why did we do that and why that. It's not just one final result, we have hundred results, uh, but to find the one that fits all the other aspects, it's covered 14 dates and so on. Uh, so, I thank you for your attention and again, it ought to have been a loop. <laughs> Any, any questions then to Karen specifically, or questions and observations on the range of techniques you, you've heard about um, in the last two papers? They are all uh, longing for their lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Package 
did you use your correspondence uh, analysis? Uh, I, I have a version that's made by a colleague in Moscow. That was the original name was Fark. Uh, and but he uh, re wrote it so that it could, could be used as an add-in in Excel sheet. Yes, it can be done in other things. Uh, Can't it? I mean, I was thinking for people who don't have access to that. Well, it's absolutely freely accessible on the internet. All right. Uh, on a site called archeoinfo.dk. Uh, the information is in the book, John says, <laughs> and it's green. Any other points, observations, comments, please? questions? In that case, I'm oh, sorry, Sam. I'm just going to ask Karen. I mean, you said that um, as you're going through, you start to uh, throw things out because they don't explain it and you realise that it's not going to take you on and, and, and you know, aren't part of the system at all. So does that um, have any implications for us in the, the 6th and 7th centuries? Are there things that you have spotted in your process that are dated or placed within a, a, a common typology that actually don't belong there? Uh, some of the problems here uh, come from graves where you have only got two classified options. And if the one is a spearhead, I don't trust the spearhead identification because it may, especially in my extremely attempted, uh, attempt to make topology on spearheads, it looks so uh, obvious. But uh, there are so many ways of saying, ah, yeah, and so on. And I think Tanya once told me every time she sees the spearheads, it's uh, turned into a new type because <laughs> nothing is fine, but it's fell on and off. Uh, and so there are many reasons for if the one thing is a spearhead, no, rather leave it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is such as uh, sample one, that it simply doesn't fit normal life in that period. And uh, there is the occasional heirloom, uh, they are rare, but they are there. I mean, it just occurs to me that sort of collectively you can probably come up with a list of things that really need some attention paid to them. Yeah, this and, and we went back and checked all those files and times we had uh, taken away yeah. uh, to see why didn't they fit in. Yeah. And another thing is there may be types that, although we didn't see it at the first hand, they are more or less constants. Or they are so rare that they uh, have a long life, so they come here and there and there. And constants usually uh, tend to stay in the uh, middle of the parabola or do it all in, into the where the uh, 0.0 is. And uh, yeah, I just think there could be some really interesting feedback from both our projects yeah. actually into artifactual research, <coughs> particularly with um, you know joint projects at the VN and that sort of thing. You know, <coughs> PhDs that concentrate on the things that really need to be yeah. sorted out. I, I think that's, that's a very valuable point, and, and the point Karen makes about uh, correspondence analysis that it is, it is, like everything else has been done in both projects, it is iterative mm -hmm. um, and time consuming, and that when you're dealing with assemblage analysis in this way, chronologically, there is going to be an inertia which comes from types whose form remains constant for a long period of time, which therefore are not chronologically distinctive. And it is not a fiddle to take those out of the equation in order to refine the chronology on the basis of those types which are chronologically distinctive. Uh, and that's one thing more. If you are using uh, assemblages from old excavation, uh, there may be the occasion and situation where you have a, a mixed assemblage. <coughs> or an update from one grave have been switched into another by accident. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> we, we think they are not, but I think that it happens. Okay, any, any further questions or, or observations? David. Um, yes, rather tentatively, let's comment. So um, I introduce David. Sorry, 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 David Lee. Uh, rather tentatively, there's a um, suggestion for another criterion that could sometimes be used in uh, typology. 
and that is the use of observation on where there are certain objects, like roaches, particularly things with corners that wear down, where you can observe <coughs> that they are very worn down. You've got some sort of some some input there in in in, in the age of the object. The fact that something isn't worn doesn't actually help. It might have been used a lot, but but if it is worn, then yeah. I think you've got something you could who could feed into your yeah. typologies or even into your chronologies. It of course also depends on the preservation of the objects. Yes. But there is uh, a couple of uh, grapes in our sample that actually have objects that if you come from, uh, take from the earliest object to the latest one, uh, it's over a hundred years. But uh, it's, it stands so much out from the rest that it was quite obvious what, what had been happening. So the antique dealers' wives. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I sense uh, curiosity is satisfied for the moment. But, uh...